I'm often asked, what's my favorite city in the world? Well, it depends. On one hand, there are cities great for visiting as a tourist, and on the other, those that are simply amazing places to live in. One has to do with beautiful landmarks, majestic monuments, fabulous restaurants, and all sorts of amazing tourist attractions. The other has more to do with the urban environment and the quality of living. In this episode, we take a look at the latter to see how smart and sustainable urban design, civic engagement, new technology, and the political will of leaders can create the world's most livable cities. So join us, I'm David Saldran, and this is Executive Class. Great cities appeal to more than just civic pride. A well-designed and livable metropolis is more likely to be a magnet for young and creative talent, business investments, tourists, and big-ticket property development. We're seeing it happen everywhere, from Barcelona to Ljubljana, Stockholm to Singapore, Bordeaux to Tokyo. Cities that are being reshaped and redesigned with mobility and quality of life foremost in mind. New urbanism is hardly, well, new at all. The ancient city of Athens was a model of urban planning in its heyday. Modern town squares have changed little from the concept of the Greek agora, a shared space enjoyed by citizens from all walks of life. A groundbreaking idea back then that paved the way for democratic government. Imperial Rome was less enamored with Athenian democracy, but they took urban planning a step further with their version of the Roman Forum, the Civic Center, surrounded by a grid of streets, aqueducts, and sewers. Rome too, though thoroughly Christian by then, was the site of one of the most impressive attempts to redesign a growing metropolis in pre-modern times. After the fall of the Roman Empire, Rome was literally left to rot. It wasn't only until the start of the early Renaissance that Rome, now the seat of the papacy, embarked on an ambitious urban regeneration program. And this, the Piazza del Popolo, is one of the finest examples of that. Much of what Rome looks like today we owe to Pope Sixtus V. His plan? To build a series of wide and straight streets to interconnect with the city's gates, monuments, and pilgrimage churches. From a city of tangled, chaotic medieval streets, Sixtus gave Rome its unmistakable townscape, long, uninterrupted vistas, leading to magnificent monuments and expansive piazzas. Before Sixtus V set about redrawing the streetscape, his predecessor, Julius II, started an urban renewal project of his own. Congestion was already a huge problem, especially with thousands of pilgrims descending on St. Peter's in Rome. After rebuilding the Vatican, Julius tapped his favorite architect, Bramante, to construct new access roads through Rome to manage traffic and the flow of pilgrims to St. Peter's. One of these roads, Via Giulia, a half-mile long, arrow-straight street named after the Pope, remains little change from those days. It's one of my favorite walks in the city, and among the most elegant, a superbly designed thoroughfare with generous space for pedestrians to admire the grand palazzos and beautiful churches that line the street, or peek into street corners to see a side of Rome that few get to see. What Popes Julius and Sixus did for Rome, Napoleon III and Baron Haussmann did much the same for Paris level the dark and dingy medieval neighborhoods of the French capital to make way for the wide, tree-lined boulevards and squares that give the right bank of the city its unparalleled charm. One of the things that makes Paris so beautiful is its urban design and architecture and its emphasis on lines, perspectives and uninterrupted views that lead the eye to one of its many grand monuments. And here at the Jardin de Tuileries, you get a good sense of that. 
Papal Rome and Houseman Paris teach us how the foresight and political will of leaders can create order out of chaos, transform congestion into mobility, and urban decay into places of beauty for citizens to converge and tourists to admire. The practice of tearing down the entire city blocks or neighborhoods by decree is no longer possible in our democratic setting. But city planners have other options at their disposal. Here's how some cities around the world are addressing congestion, gridlock, and pollution to improve the quality of living. Less cars, less traffic. It's a no-brainer. But hey, people still need to get around, right? That's why livable cities turn to biking as an alternative mode of transport. Copenhagen especially. The Danish capital owns a distinction as the world's most bicycle-friendly city. More than a third of the population use a bicycle to commute. No wonder there's hardly any traffic, even at rush hour in the city. Copenhagen is flat and compact, ideal conditions for biking. But the real push comes from the local government. The city has built over 390 kilometers of bicycle lanes, dedicated tracks, even bicycle-only bridges, and counting. Pretty much every local owns a bike, so to reduce parking problems and theft, bike-sharing programs are gaining popularity. The results are encouraging. Safer streets for pedestrians, healthier citizens, less pollution and cars on the streets. You might say Manila is too hot for biking. Well, Tel Aviv in Israel proves that heat shouldn't be a problem. The city is warm almost year-round, but thanks to an ambitious program in the 90s, biking is now a popular alternative mode of commuting. About 20% commute to work or school by bike. And when the city introduced its bike-sharing program in 2011, bike riding ballooned by more than 50%. Today, you can actually bike from one end of the city's coastline to the other, taking the fantastic views of the Mediterranean Sea along the way. Elsewhere in the city, bikers have priority in dedicated lanes, and anyone who violates a policy is fined heavily. To get people to bike, you need to give them an incentive. In the case of Copenhagen and Tel Aviv, that means safe, seamless, and strictly enforced bike lanes. Plus the added joy biking through breathtaking scenery brings. Biking is cool, but it takes a lot to give up one's car. In Barcelona, the local government has introduced a number of ways to get people to do that. They've added more bike lanes across the city, launched a popular bike sharing program, and continue to beef up the tram system that provides efficient and pollution-free commuting. Despite these, congestion is still a problem, and Barcelona has turned to a radical concept of superblocks that aims to give the streets back to its citizens. The plan is to turn 60% of the streets into citizen spaces. That means entire blocks of the city will be car-free, with vehicles diverted to main roads only. Barcelona's scheme is still in its infancy. Cities like Stockholm and Singapore are relying on a tried and tested formula through congested relief pricing in combination with higher taxes for vehicle ownership. In Stockholm, the Swedish Transport Administration uses automatic number plate recognition to charge car owners depending on where and what time of day they're traveling. The congestion tax encourages residents to take public transport or bicycles instead. Singapore's fully automatic electronic road pricing scheme works in a similar way, with variable pricing designed to respond to congestion in real time. Overhead gantries detect the vehicle, the congestion at the time, and deduct the appropriate fee automatically. The higher the volume of traffic, the higher the toll, which encourages drivers to avoid those routes altogether or avoid peak hours on the road. Stockholm and Singapore schemes work because both cities invested heavily in accessible public transportation networks as well. It's clear by now that without an efficient and affordable public transport system, people aren't going to give up their private car so easily. And by simply adding more public buses on the road, well, that isn't going to solve the problem either. In fact, it could even worsen congestion. The answer, at least for many European cities, is a tightly knit and efficiently run light rail system. 
preferably electric-powered trams. Unlike elevated rail transport, trams require simpler, cheaper infrastructure. Less time building overhead tracks also means less disruption to the flow of traffic, more privacy for residents living below, and they integrate so easily with other modes of public transport. Cities like Prague and the Czech Republic are blessed with a historic cityscape and a spectacular skyline. A tram does little to alter that, in the way an elevated train network would. Lisbon's hilly terrain makes elevated trains impossible, and thank goodness, they've stood by their trams and funiculars. They're not just icons of the city, they provide easy, affordable, and emission-free transport too. No doubt, trams have their benefits, but they're not optimized to move a critical mass of people simultaneously, and as quickly, at least as subway systems do. Welcome to Tokyo, one of the world's most congested cities. No surprise, it's the home of the most extensive and most advanced subway system the world has seen. It's amazing, you can get around Tokyo without ever having to take a taxi, a car or a bus, just by train. And that includes to and from the airport, both international airports. And Ueno Station is your gateway to Narita International Airport through the Keisei Line. Tokyo has more than its fair share of cars, taxis and buses. But with so many people commuting simultaneously, Tokyo would come to a complete standstill total gridlock without their subway. More than 7 million people transit Tokyo Metro's 179 subway stations and 195 kilometers of rail from 5 in the morning to midnight every day. In time-starved Tokyo, a train ride cuts the journey from one part of the city to another substantially. But that's not the only benefit. Subway stations serve as so-called third spaces after the home and workplace. It's where Tokyoites spend their time dining or shopping, and in times of crisis, as emergency shelters as well. Well, here's some good news. Metro Manila will have its own subway system soon, part of which will run close to where I'm standing right now. But a subway system alone won't solve the problem. Citizens need living space as well. When we come back, we'll show you how some cities are reclaiming land for public use.